All right, guys. Uh, I hope everybody is doing okay. Well, my throat is not doing okay, but I will try to run through this uh, regardless. Look, last time around, we had an example where we said a coffee machine dispenses a cup of coffee 80.23 milliliters. And that was an average value. That's fine. We said that as a null hypothesis. And then we defined our alternative hypothesis as mean being greater than 80.23. We had a test a sample mean of 82 and we defined a test statistic z value which translated into 3.54 corresponded to a 0 0.002 area or probability and we said this is a p value meaning this is a value which tells us that how likely is it that the sample mean is a one off chance or a one off occurrence or a coincidence that we got 82 milliliters of sample mean by chance and since this is a very small value this meant this is uh, this has a very slim chance of being a coincidence therefore this is in fact true this is in fact what's happening this is the phenomena that is dominating and this is evidence enough to reject the null hypothesis remember we work this under the assumption that null hypothesis is true 80.23 is what happens, but if we got 82, that means we are now having some sort of concrete evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Well, then the conversation then steered towards how low is low enough? Is 0 0.002 low enough? And then we said we could define a threshold value, a test significance or an alpha value of, uh, of 0.05 is 5% and if our p-value is less than this alpha we could reject the null hypothesis so we defined a rule for rejecting the null hypothesis but the conversation now is headed towards this being a one-tailed test because we are checking this decision rule on one side of the spectrum on one side of the normal distribution what we could do is we could also check this on the other side of the normal distribution towards the left hand side and this would also mean that this is a one-tailed test but notice that our alternative hypothesis would then be less than 80.23 right because now we're checking the other side in the previous instance we had the alternative hypothesis as greater than 80.23 and so if we are checking for less than 80.23 our sample mean would be something less than 80 be 78.46 for example would translate to some z value which would correspond to some p value in this case it's the same 0 0.002 but what's important here is to understand that it would be nice if we could define one alternative hypothesis that could take care of both of these cases greater than 80.23 and less than 80.23 turns out we could do that we could define an alternative hypothesis by setting up like this where we could say mean value is not equals to 80.23 so this then handles both sides if it's not 80.23 it could be greater than 80.23 and it could be less than 80.23 so meaning it could it could it could handle both cases by just setting a, the alternative hypothesis like this and what this then transpires into a, is a is a is a normal distribution that takes care of both of these tails together just as in this case where we see the greater than 80.23 tail as well as the less than 80.23 uh, tail as well so we we are we are looking at both of these cases and we could take care of uh, of the alternative hypothesis in that manner um, but remember this does not this does not change our test statistic the test statistic remains the same it has nothing to do with the uh, value of the alternative or the way we have defined our alternative hypothesis so we still have we still have the 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 z the z value here set up as 3.54 and negative 3.54 the probability area that we computed corresponding to 3.54 is 0 0.002 that remains the same as it is but a fundamental thing that has changed now is the area corresponding to the alpha value the significance level notice it gets divided into two parts 
on either side of the tail, on either side of this, uh, on, on both sides of the, of the normal distribution. So we're looking on both the tails now. So it, the alpha value gets divided on both the tails. So this area is now 0 0.025. This area is also 0 0.025 because the significance level alpha is 0 0.05. So half of this is here and the other half is on the right hand side. But it would only make sense that if the alpha gets divided on both sides, the p-value should also be, in fact, distributed on both sides, on both tails. And this is what happens. This is what happens. The p-value now is not just 0 0.0002. The p-value now is the sum of both of these 0 0.0002. Or we could say it just gets multiplied by 2. So the p-value for a two-tailed test is twice that of a one-tailed test, and it is now 0 0.004. The decision rule remains the same. The p-value still needs to be less than alpha to reject the null hypothesis, and 0 0.004 is, in fact, less than 0 0.05, the alpha value significance level of the test, and therefore we reject the null hypothesis. Now, think about this for a second. Uh, intuitively, this should also make sense. The p-value should in fact be greater for a two-tailed test because we're checking both ends of the spectrum. We're, we're respecting the greater than and the less than case in our alternative hypothesis and therefore it should be hard to reject the null hypothesis now. The p-value has risen, right? So it is now closer to alpha as compared to the one-tailed test. And since we are respecting both cases, the greater than and the less than case, it is only fair that our p-value is also greater. And for that reason, we include both of these areas on both of these uh, tails. So that is the key difference between the single tail and the two tail test. Um, it's a simpler way to respect both cases rather than doing one tail tests separately it makes more sense to have a two-tailed test and comprehensively look at both ends of the spectrum and design our tests in a more credible way.